We don't have in the New Testament a life of Jesus. What we have are four independent evangelists. The early church did not call these the gospels, they called them the evangelists. Evangelists each are like evangelistic tracts, more or less, booklets, if you will, that were sent out to give people an understanding of who Jesus was. Each of them had a point of view. Three of them are so similar, they're called synoptic. Same view, synoptic, like optical. The same view of what Jesus had done. So our beginning today will be to lay in the life of Jesus and then lay over top of it each of the four evangelists. I recognize when we do that, that I am handling the Bible in a way that is different than I have taught you to handle the Bible. I'm going to do something and I'm going to ask you to be patient with me. I started with each Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I taught, started teaching through them, thoroughly understanding them as best I could. With my limited abilities, I just did what I could with the four Gospels. Now, I'm going to step on top of them and feed back to you, here's the life of Jesus, and then fit them into it. But that is not how you should begin the study. The way you should begin the study is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and do it from the bottom up. You do not borrow the scripture to say what you already had in your outline, right? There's a difference between preaching the Bible and preaching what you want and using the Bible to say it. I'm not doing that, but it'll appear that I am. And the reason I'm being careful about that is because I have thoroughly taught each of the books and will do that with you. We will spend time in each of these books. But first, I need to give you a skeleton. That skeleton comes from understanding the books and teaching the books and walking the land. And from that skeleton, I want to develop, where does Matthew, how does Matthew demonstrate that skeleton or Mark or Luke or John? It's almost impossible to teach a life based on any one of these gospels. You need all four gospels. Matthew gives you primarily the words of Jesus. By now, you should be used to me saying this the words of Jesus, because there are five major sermons in Matthew, and they are, in fact, the major backbone of it. You're going to read over and over in Matthew about the teaching and healing ministry of Jesus, Matthew 4.12, Matthew 4.23, Matthew 8.17. You're going to read over and over about this is how Jesus taught, this is how Jesus healed, this is how Jesus dealt with people. Matthew's interested in the engagement of Jesus between Jesus and the crowds, between Jesus and the disciples, between Jesus and some individuals. Now, John is radical about this. He wants to tell you every interview Jesus had with, with a, um, uh, his mother at Cana, with Nicodemus in the night, with a woman at the well. He's, he's all about these one-on-one -on -one dialogues. Matthew is more the shotgun blast of Jesus to the crowd, Jesus to the group of disciples. But you remember that Matthew 5, 6, and 7 give us the Sermon on the Mount. And by now, you should be ready to jump right in there and understand that the Sermon on the Mount is going to be the kickoff of his discipleship ministry. He's going to talk about uh, what, is, what are the character points of a disciple? What are the, the um, costs of discipleship? What are the commitment levels of a disciple? What are the choices of a disciple? That's going to be, in fact, the outline of that, of that message. And we're going to come back and look at it. I've tried to sample it a little bit before now, but we're going to look at it. And then you're going to deal with Jesus in the Galilee and in his popular ministry, and he's going to get partway through, and he's going to send out a large number of disciples. And before he does that, he's going to give a, a specific sermon on this is what it means to go in my name and pick up the message of the kingdom and bring it to a village. Here are the rules of how you communicate the message that the kingdom is near, and that's in Matthew 10. So I've got a sermon in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 that's on the, uh, the uh, character and the commitments and choices of a disciple, and then I've got one on how a disciple is to behave on the road couple of months will pass by, a year or so, and some of the disciples will defect, 
some of the fringe followers, and I use the word disciple with the small d, meaning there were many, not just the 12. And some will just turn away and get cold and kind of back off, and then there'll be another message, and this message will be about success. Where is that found? 13, that is the Sermon on Success. What does it mean to really have an impact in ministry, and what does it mean not to? And no part, no part of Jesus' definition of success will be about the number of chariots in the parking lot. No part of it. No part of Jesus' Sermon on Success will have anything to do whatsoever with popularity. And I would argue that the church in the 21st century needs to grab the seven pictures of the standard of success in Matthew 13 and redefine success in the church because the franchisers and publishers are redefining Jesus' definition of success. You're not successful unless you're doing the latest 30 days of whatever. And we're running the movie on the History Channel and you need to be running it in your sermons. As if the spirit isn't the leader of the church, the franchisers are. And I will take issue with their definition of success from ground up. Amen. One of the reasons I'll do that is Tom over here and other people like him. If success is about popularity, then let the people on the Cocoa River die in their sin. Let's go do the things that are going to bring the bigger crowds and get more money and reaffirm our importance, because that's success. No, it's not. No, it's not. And the point is that I, I'm, I'm only being hard on them for one reason. They are being ungodly. Therefore, I will be hard. Let me go another direction and say that a couple of chapters go on and, and it's late in the Galilee ministry and Jesus takes his disciples and they have their final exam and after the final exam, Jesus is, is um, seen in all of his glory and after that, all of the disciples are getting whipped up into a frenzy because Jesus has shown that he is God the, the, the glory of God has shone on him. Moses came and Elijah came and they're going, this is great. We're in the movement. We're going to win. Jesus said, strap on some swords. We're going to the Passover. They're going, yes. All right. The glory of God is going to fall in Jerusalem. He who multiplied the loaves and fishes will multiply the swords. We are going to kick out the pasta eating pagans and get on with it. Yes. And then they begin to have a discussion about their own importance and who's more important than the other disciple. Because that is immediately what happens when the church redefines success and decides that it's doing a good job. The day your ministry swells, you decide you're really a cool person. You know how many people think I'm a cool person, you say to yourself. And then you begin to, to look at the other lowly disciples and say, aren't you glad I'm in the ministry together with you? And if you think that that's not what really goes on, you haven't been to a pastor's meeting. And then what happens is, Jesus says, I need to talk to you guys about getting along and forgiving one another. Because... You're such boneheads, you're going to do things that wound each other, and you're going to need to know about the standard of forgiveness. And so Matthew 18 rolls out a standard of forgiveness. By the way, it comes on the back of an argument with the disciples. And so when you fast forward to Matthew 18 and you see him, it's at this point that Jesus is heading toward Jerusalem. In 19, 20, and 21, he will make his way all the way into the place of, of the Passion, but during that time, in the late part of his ministry, there's going to be some very hard sayings of Jesus. They're often called the bad mood sayings of Jesus. And by the time he gets into Jerusalem for the Passion, you're going to see in 21, he's going to come in. There's the triumphal entry. We'll celebrate it with Palm Sunday, and everybody's excited. But remember that the people in that text are not thinking that a spiritual king came to bring repentance to their heart and join them to the people of God. They're thinking a metallic king has come to multiply swords and kick out Romans. They're on an entirely different page than Jesus is. 
And Jesus saith unto the Father, Oi, <laughs> what do I do with this group you gave me? And he comes into the city of Jerusalem, and partway through the week, in a lot of problems that he had with Jewish leadership, he says, uh, I know you're impressed with the buildings of the temple. Look hard, because not one stone is going to be left standing on another. He said that, by the way, after a long eight blistering woes in Matthew 23. See, the last sermon is, is really a double sermon. It's 23, and you might be a Pharisee if you look like any of the following of these eight character traits. And then 24, Lord, look at these buildings. Look, because not one stone's going to be left on another. And he goes to the Mount of Olives and sits down and continues that last sermon in 24 with the apocalyptic narrative of how do things end? What is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And then question and answer time in 25. So I want you to think of that last sermon as a double whammy. The sermon toward the disciples about the Pharisees is 23, but toward the destruction of the temple and the end times is 24, and the question and answer that follows is 25. And that's the final sermon. What is he saying in 24? 24 is really, he's answering the question. What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And if I was looking for a word to hang it on, end would be the word. So think of it in terms of an apocalyptic sermon. It's a good question. Okay, so by the time you get to the end of the story then, between 26 and 27, you're going to have the crucifixion and resurrection story. And that will be Matthew's attempt to tell you the story of Jesus. Now, I told you all that by way of introduction because I want you to understand that Matthew gives you a very long explanation from the words of Jesus, what he is, who he is, why he came, what he's trying to do. We're going to synthetically look at the mark, but we're going to actually make the argument that Mark doesn't start with the birth of Jesus. It doesn't even have a birth of Jesus. He hits the ground and he's ministering and it's all about John the baptizer in ministry. And the first 30 years of Jesus is evacuated out of the scene. It's basically he drops in and here he is ready to go. And it has more of a priestly emphasis of Jesus's ministry in the respect that until he's 30, nothing happened. From the standpoint of a priest, until you're 30, nothing happened, right? So life begins at 30, you will be happy to know. Um, unless you're a vestal virgin, then it doesn't begin till 40. But that's a whole other thing. My, my point is that Mark will give you in the first nine chapters the rising tide of Jesus dealing in the Galilee ministry. And chapter 8, before the end of that, is the final exam. So 8 and 9 give you the final exam, the time of the transfiguration, and then Jesus sets his face toward the cross. And basically, you take a look at chapter 10, and it's the journey toward Jerusalem, the Perean ministry. And by chapter 11 through 16, it is the Passion Week. I'm going to set these in a frame for you. This is just the introduction. This is my preamble. Luke tries to outline not just the words that Matthew give and the works that Mark gives. Luke tries to put them in order, and that's where we're going to begin with our class and try to actually set things as best we can in order and then fit the story together. If you have the words in Matthew and the works in Mark, when you get to Luke, you get the chronology because he says in Luke 1, 1 to 4, Theo, lots of people wrote the words and works. I'm going to put them in order. And John comes along at the end of this. By the time John is writing, everybody who wrote Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and pretty much everybody they interviewed was dead. John's writing as, a, as the cherry on top of the whipped cream on top of the Sunday. It's a lot later than the making of the Sunday. And he says, there's still something you don't understand about the gospel. I'm going to include only some little vignettes of Jesus dealing with individuals because I need to show you the conflict that's going on in the background of the Gospels between Jesus and the Judean aristocracy. I want you to understand something. There's a, a conflict that's raging in the background. So John skips most of the ministry of Jesus and summarizes all the Galilee that took Mark 1 through 9. He puts it in a chapter and a half. He said, it's, not, it's incidental where something happened to me. Here's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in every time Jesus went to Jerusalem, he got in an argument. 
So he'll have John 3 and Nicodemus coming to him by night, but he sets it up so that he can help um, uh, Nicodemus as a Pharisee understand the incredible contrast between what he's saying a walk with God is and how one gets into a walk with God and what the Pharisees are saying. The Pharisees had blurred the lines into a lifestyle. And Jesus said it starts with an event. Now you have no idea why that's important. You have no idea why that's important. But let me just tell you, yours is the generation that is taking the gospel and blurring the lines. I sat with pastors and I asked this question. Young men, seminary trained, how do I become a Christian? And I got the blurriest, longest answers you've ever heard. I got, well, you know, it's a thing of the spirit and it's done from within. How do I become a Christian? What must I do to be saved? And I sat with men and they couldn't answer the question. And they're the good guys. You are living in a time when you're going to watch us take a very simple gospel message and turn it into something extraordinarily hard to understand. The Pharisees had already done it, and Jesus said, born again, there's an event that happens in your life. Oh, but in the mystery of God, there's an event that happens in your life. Yeah, but it's a really spiritual thing. Yes, and I want to put you in a tank of water because I want you to see an event that happens in your life. There's something going on in the background. You're going to walk out into churches and sit and listen to invitations, and you as a believer aren't going to know when you're invited. You're going to sit there and go, what just happened? As postmodernism sweeps into the church and changes our message and blurs all the lines. Jesus deals with Nicodemus and gets him to understand the event of being born again. But that's not all he does. A couple chapters later, he's back in Jerusalem in John 5. And there's a guy lying on a porch for 38 years trying to figure out if he's committed enough to roll over into the water when an angel stirs the water at the pools of Bethesda. And every time he looks over the edge of the 42-foot drop to the bottom and says, uh-uh, not today. And Jesus says, get up, clean up your stuff, walk on. The guy does it, and the same day it was Sabbath, and the rest of the chapter's about an argument over Sabbath. Guy comes along in John 9, and he's um, sitting there, and he's blind, and nobody had ever paid any attention to him, and Jesus uh, heals his blindness, and the same day it's the Sabbath, and he ends up getting thrown out of the synagogue because he got healed on the wrong day of the week, like he cared what day his eyesight came back. And there ends up being a big conflict. And John's gospel is all about these conflicts that keep coming up. Every time Jesus says something, does something, there ends up in a conflict. And John is trying to make the point that it's true, Jesus said some cool stuff. It's true, he did some wonderful things. It's true, he had some marvelous crowds. But the people who were in charge of the temple and the seminary hated what he was doing. And I want to tell you why. And I want to explain how he revealed who he was. And I, I want you to see that when you really look at who Jesus is, he, he revealed himself in a very profound way. And I want you to understand that the things that I'm going to share with you about his life are written that you might believe, and in believing have life. Okay, so let's begin before we go to prayer with one simple statement. The point of the record of Jesus is not to tell you all the details of his life. That's not the point. The point of the record of Jesus is to tell you enough about him that you would understand what you must believe to be saved. The, the point is the redemption story had come to a head. And God was about to invade man's space and dramatically take over. And the way he was going to do it was force a, 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 a dividing line in the heart and mind of people. There was a day yesterday when I didn't know God. Today I can know God. I can have a permanent fixture of a relationship with God in my life and all of the sin issue is off the table and I can walk with him. And that's going to happen in the life of Jesus. There's a sense in which you've been building toward this since day one. 
you climbed your way through the hoarded household of Leviticus. You squirmed your way through the heat of the wilderness. You were pummeled by prophets and kings as you sat there and said, no more, Jeremiah, no more. And now you get the reason for all of it. Because from the garden, God had made a promise. I'm going to raise up the seed of a woman without a man. And that one that grows up is going to crush the head of the one who brought rebellion into my world. And I'm going to make sure along the way there'll be a wound, but I'm going to make sure his head is crushed. We're only part way to the story. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give you the action of the stepping down on the head of the enemy. But it's not crushed until Revelation. What I'd like to do is um, I would like to put some bones on the story, if I can. Now, let's, every time I do this, I do it a different way, and I do it a lot. But let's um, start off with Matthew, since the Gospels do. And um, I don't know which of the four Gospels came first, and I don't frankly care. There's a lot of scholarly information on Markin priority and Matthew priority, and they're all based on the premise that whoever wrote first has something to do with the story. Let me just suggest to you that if all four of them have the same author and it's God, it doesn't matter which direction he decided to write it. Okay? That will be my position. So you all can take all that stack of stuff you'll get in seminary, throw it on a heap, and say, I don't really care. Okay? Let's move on to something more important. And that is that the story of Jesus' ministry, okay, we're going to go together, many of us, and we're going to travel through Jesus' life, and the story of his ministry should be set on the ground. Can we all agree on that? That, that the story of your life took place in geography? That this is not an ethereal Jesus floating above the earth. It's a baby being born and um, being placed in a manger. And, and it's a baby going to Egypt. And it's a baby going to, to Nazareth, a toddler growing up there, a young person uh, running around the little street and alleyway of Nazareth and knowing kids next door. And it's a, it's a young man who first emerges into the story. So let me outline it with just the big sweep of the way chronologers tell the story in geography, okay? So this is the chronology as it's played out in the geography of the life of Jesus. Most of us will have what we're going to call the early Judean ministry. This has become such a well-known topic that it's simply called by chronologers EJ. It really is. You will see, for instance, Thomas and Gundry, Robertson, and others who will just say the EJ ministry of Jesus, and you're supposed to know it's the early Judean ministry of Jesus. Early Judea. Now, Judea is the area in the south of the country. When we go on tour, we're going to spend our time in Jerusalem and Bethlehem that are both underneath my fingernail there. And we're going to spend time in Galilee underneath my three fingers up there. We're going to spend some time along the coast underneath my index finger. But we're not going to see two-thirds of the country, which is the desert. And the reason we're not is Jesus spent some time there um, meeting with the enemy, but it's not, it's probably the desert closer to Jerusalem. And, and he never really walked down there. There's not really much happening for our story, and we're going to be covering the story of Jesus. So our story will be starting on the coast, dealing with this, and then ending up over here. And much of the country we will not be visiting, because we're going to select off the buffet of the geography and really center our understanding on what the Gospels do. So the Gospels really begin with some stories in and around Jerusalem. And they start off with stories like the announcement of Gabriel to Zacharias that you're going to have a child. And, and then there's a quick jaunt up to Nazareth where the, um, Gabriel shows up and tells a young girl, you're going to bear Messiah. Then cut back to uh, Judea. So the early Judean ministry isn't that everything happens in Judea. It's that's the center of where things are happening. When Jesus has a Galilean ministry, he's going to go to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem's not in Galilee. But it's a trip. We're talking about where the center of the story is, not where every detail is. Do we understand? Okay, so the early Judean ministry is Jesus and the forerunner, John, and the story's ramping up to the birth and the birth story. 
Now, if you were looking for where those show up, you're going to find that the first four chapters of Matthew and the first four chapters of Luke tell that story. So Matthew 1 to 4 and Luke 1 to 4. And when I say 1 to 4, I mean 1 to 4 all the way up through about the verse, verse 13. So I'm going to stick that here in Matthew's gospel. Give the early Judean ministry. Now, expect to see things like a genealogy. Expect to see things like um, the uh, um, forerunner and the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth and, and, and expect to see things like the death of the babies, the innocent babies of Bethlehem. Expect to see those in the early Judean section. It's not the ministry of Jesus, it's the life of Jesus. It doesn't become the ministry until he turns about 30 years of age, right? What's the marker at the end of the early Judean ministry that kicks off the ministry of Jesus. Does anybody know? Is it the baptism? That's it. Ten points. There she goes, Tori. Um, the baptism of Jesus is the ending point. And from the baptism, what does Jesus do? go away with? Clean skin. But what else? Holy Spirit, what else? Is there a what else after the Holy Spirit? Uh, what else? A public proclamation. He had public proclamation followed by what else? What's going to characterize the whole next section of his ministry? Who's he hanging out with? Disciples. He'll get the first five. The first five of his disciples come from the John the Baptist Evangelistic Movement Incorporated. They were hanging out with John before they were hanging out with Jesus. Now, we're going we're gonna to put details in this. I'm just giving you a quick thumbnail sketch. Jesus takes his first five followers. and what you, what, Let me just be very technical for a minute. What actually happens is he's introduced to the first five. They get together with Jesus. They conclude that he is worth following. They decide to bind themselves to a rabbi, which means you are now going to follow after what this rabbi teaches, and you're going to do what he says. And once they do that, he promptly leaves them. He leaves them and says, I'll meet you at Passover in Jerusalem, and he goes out to the wilderness to be alone. He has now gotten his first five followers. Those are found in the earliest chapter of John. And he goes out alone, and what does he do there alone? What's his first big experience as an adult alone in the scriptures about? Matthew chapter 4. The temptation in the wilderness. And what is the center issue of the temptation? What does Satan offer him? Okay, now, I, I appreciate the way you said that, but think about what you just said, Lewis. To worship. Is the thing that Satan offers him, oh, bow down and worship me? I mean, does that sound like an offer? That it, no, Would you buy that? that? Would you go, oh, yes, I can't wait. Let me bow down and worship. What did he offer? The world. The world. He offered him popularity. He offered him success by a human standard. And the issue is, how will I be made known? Jesus already was a king, but he was a king that nobody else saw as a king. And the question is, how will I put my crown on so everybody sees me? Will I throw myself off the top of a building? Let the angels come? How will I be made known? And who defines my ministry? Satan wanted only one thing. Let me just tell you how to do it. Take my advice. Do it my way. And the cleavage in the road, the fork that was in front of him was, I can do it the father's way or the enemy's way. That will be incredibly important. How did Jesus answer Satan each time? He just took out the word. Did he turn and read it? No. Where did it come from? So he did, he studied ahead so that when the enemy met him, the word was implanted, right? That's going to be an important pattern. So now he's got the spirit of God and the word of God, and he faces the enemy of God. 
and he uses the word of God against the enemy of God and walks back into Jerusalem and then picks up the first five followers again. And then he takes them on a road trip. Road trip! Where are they going? Where are they going? They go to the second stage of the ministry, which is the Galilean ministry. And the Galilean ministry, simply noted by G, includes actually in many, many writers three stages, okay? I'm just going to put these out here because not everybody breaks, uh, Thomas and Gundry break them into nine stages. We're only going to have four or five, okay? So the Galilean ministry includes um, what we would call uh, Western Lower Galilee, And that will be Cana, Nazareth, and the area around. An educated way to say that is environs, meaning area around. Okay, from that, at the end of his first tour in the Cana, Nazareth area, what, give me some of the events of that early area. John 2 comes up as Cana. Give me an event from John 2 that would make Jesus um, delightfully invited to many parties. He turns water into wine, and from that point on, you should see the invitations in the local post office, the things going bananas. Okay? And he goes to Cana, but after that, he goes to Nazareth, and in Nazareth, the reception in Nazareth was a little different. What was the reception? He goes in Luke chapter 4, and he turns to the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's called me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the, the, the brokenhearted, to shatter the chains of the prisoner and set him free. Today, these very things are happening within your hearing, and they're going, preach it. Yes, all right. And you would say to me, the things that you did over on yonder hill just northeast of here, would you do them here too because we're running short on wine ourselves? But I say to you, even the great prophet Elijah did not go only to his own people, but to other people. Summary statement, I'm not doing what you want. And they saith unto him, oh, Jesus, what a wonderful preacher you are. Now, what did they do? They took him to the edge of the brow of a hill to do what? Celebrate his ability to float? We remember when you were a baby in the crib and you used to levitate ever so well. No! They want to throw him into a pit and stone him until he's dead. Don't get wise with us! You want to be made known, you do it according to the way we do it. You come up in a clan, you come up in a village, you come up in a family. Don't get all uppity with us. You shut up and do what you're told. Well, that's not the reception Jesus wants. When, as a pastor, when people try to kill you, this is not the reception you're hoping for at the end of the message. When, I mean, it's one thing when some nut comes in with a gun. It's another thing when they all take out their guns. This is not a moment you're going, oh, yeah, there it is. I am so popular. So Jesus decides, you know, maybe relocation would be a good idea right about now in the ministry. And so he moves to around the sea. What is the most important city around the sea or cities around the sea that will become important to the ministry of Jesus during this prayer? Uh, Capernaum will be his home base. So much so, this is actually two words. Kephar is the word for village. Nahum is the word comfort, like Nahum. This is the village of Nahum. Kephar Nahum, the village of comfort. And, but he has some other cities nearby. What are the other cities? Bethsaida, and it appears as though he doesn't really go to Bethsaida, but he does borrow their boys. The Zebedee and Sons Fishing Company Incorporated has a number of guys that, that uh, are leaving their nets and going away, and the hired servants are picking up the slack. Their stock probably went down, but what we do know is their spirituality went up. Okay, so Capernaum, Bethsaida, what, who, what else? Woe to you, Bethsaida! Woe to you, Capernaum! Woe to you, 
Corazine. Corazine or Corazim, it can be spelled with a CH, it can be spelled with a C, it can be spelled with a K. Anything that sounds relatively correct is correct. It's one of the nice parts about Israeli spelling. Okay, so he does a series around the sea. By the way, on our tour, our first day we'll be doing this. Our second day we'll be doing this, in the order that it happens. And during this time, there are some great messages around the sea. Sermon on the Mount, around the sea. Sending out the 70, giving the coaching up Matthew 10 of how a disciple should go out, around the sea. And then the popularity will hit its peak here. And then problems begin to hatch. One of the problems that begins to hatch is Jesus has the audacity to heal a leper. What's different about healing a leper from healing anybody else? Let's say you heal a blind man, or you take a guy with a withered hand and you restore it. How's that different than healing a leper? There's something that should jump out at you biblically. Don't you remember Levitical law? What happens when there's a leper in the camp? If there's a cleansing of a leper, what has to happen? They have to go all the way up through the ranks and be seen as cleansed before they can come back into the community, right? So when you heal a leper, word is going to get all the way back to Jerusalem and the temple, and that's different than healing a, a blind man. You can heal a blind man and nobody but his family knows. But if you heal a leper, the high priest has to hear about it. And when word gets back that there's a leper healer, the middle of the high point of his ministry, something starts to happen. Jerusalem pays attention. And when Jerusalem pays attention, they dispatch some scribes and some Pharisees, and now the preaching of Jesus has a heckling group. Because now as he says, let me say unto thee, ah, come on, from the back of the audience. Now it's not everybody going, ah. Now it's a group that's <laughs> upset. A group that says Deuteronomy 13 invested the responsibility of the people and their welfare to us. Who are you? You upstart from Nazareth. What's the name of your rabbi anyway? Does anybody know what school this guy came from? Know this. If you walk into a college classroom where they are espousing relativity and you believe in truth and you challenge them with truth, they will not attack your statement, they will attack your education, your person, your character, your hairstyle, or anything else they can attack because when you cannot attack the subject, you attack the person giving it. And they'll go all the way around what Jesus says and go after his education. Because, now here's the thing. The education isn't relevant as to whether or not what he's saying is correct. See, if there is a wolf attacking, even a little boy can be right about it. He doesn't really need a seminary degree in wolf spotting. He just needs to yell loudly when he sees a wolf. So what happened? Yeah, Tori. Oh, sorry. What was the reference for the uh, verse about the leopard? Ah, we're coming to it, but I'm not going to tell you yet. All right. There's a reason. I want to paint a picture, then I want to hang all the details. I'll tell you why. In your life, Tori, everybody's told the details and never hung the picture. This is the part you didn't get in Sunday school. They, they told you the details of every story, but not why the whole story is the way it is. There are two specific features in the Around the Sea ministry. One, the leper story will be a signal story, but there's another one. And that's what I would call cover story. What's a cover story? I don't mean a story on the cover of a magazine. Cover stories meaning think crime. You're my cover. What does that mean? It's like a false alibi? An alibi story. So, in Jesus' case, Herod Antipas is ruling, and Jesus is right under Herod's very large nose if the statue is to be believed. And Herod is looking for Jesus, and Herod has found John the baptizer, and when Herod finds you, you end up headless. So you don't want to be found when Jesus is looking for you, or when Herod is looking for you. So Jesus is right under his nose. How does he get away with being right under his nose? Well, here's what he does. You get some interesting healing stories during this time. 
One of them is a centurion servant. Why do you care about the centurion servant? Does anybody remember the story of the centurion servant being healed? I could take you there, but I'm not going to do it right now. What, what's the highlight of the story? Jesus doesn't have to go. He just speaks and he's healed. You're thinking of a different guy. Oh, You're thinking of John 4, 46 to 54. That's the Basilicos or the mayor. Or the Basilicos. He's like a little king. And that's in John. That's a different story, but you're all, let's, let's take that one out while we're there. This is the long distance healing, right? Where Jesus actually heals long distance. And, his, and that's the Basilicos' son in that case. All right? But it is a cover story. In other words, let me say it this way, Colin. The mayor owes him. Why? Because his son's alive because of Jesus. Do you think the mayor's going to tell the king? By the way, Jesus is here. No, the mayor's going, this guy saved my son. I'm not telling anybody. How about the centurion, though? Remember, this man has helped us build our synagogue. The story of the centurion was that he was actually kind to the people of Capernaum and helped build the synagogue with his money, and he actually sponsored people in Capernaum, and he's a Roman official there, and his servant is healed by Jesus, so it's not in the Roman official, the highest-ranking Roman official in Capernaum, it's not in his best interest to turn Jesus in to Herod. It's not in the best interest of the mayor to turn Jesus into Herod because his son's got a heartbeat because of Jesus. There are a variety of teachings. I could give you four of them. There are a variety of teachings of who Jesus healed during that time. Uh, another one would be um, Jairus' daughter. Who's Jairus? Anybody know? You did read the Gospels in preparation for this, yes? Certain man, Jairus by name, catches Jesus coming off of a boat from the east side of the Sea of Galilee as he steps onto the land. The disciples are excited because he's a ruler of the synagogue, a chazan. He's a synagogue ruler. Do you see what I'm sketching out here? I just want to make sure I'm not losing you for the detail. What I'm saying is the cover story of Jesus. How can he operate in, right under Herod's nose at Capernaum? Because the mayor owes him, the ruler of the synagogue owes him, the centurion owes him, everybody owes Jesus. Why do they tell you only these healings and not other healings? Because this is what explains that Jesus is very aware of the politics of his time. And he's got the right people who are standing and blocking for him. There's no way Herod can get to him. Herod would like to. Herod can't understand how this guy who's so famous has thousands of people coming to him. Why can't I catch him? I really wanted to talk to him. How did Jesus refer to Herod? Do you remember? Fox. You go tell that fox. Does it sound like Jesus has a love relationship for Herod? Of course, he loves all men. Haven't you seen the Hallmark cards? <laughs> He doesn't like Herod, and he makes him know, you go tell that sly fox. Well, don't you think Herod took notice of that and thought, well, gee, I don't mind people making fun of me as a king. I, no, you make fun of me as a king, you lose your head. That's the John story. Your cousin was sassy, and I'll get you too. And your little dog, Toto. In other words, what you have is a cover, set of cover stories. There are two sets of stories that I want you to know cover stories and the leper story. And the leper story we'll come back to because it's a major feature. After the around the sea ministry, the rising tide of the crowd starts to get restless and Jesus, recognizing that it's late in the ministry, does something. He begins to do what is called the withdrawal ministry. Now, this is not Jesus going into a uh, rehab center. This is Withdrawal ministries, he's withdrawing geographically away from the Sea of Galilee up to the regions of Tyre and Sidon that are up here in Lebanon and up into the Golan Heights. He's getting away from places where there are kosher delis. Why would he do that? 
Why would Jesus withdraw from, from areas that are really easy for him to live in? Lots of kosher delis, lots of synagogues, all sorts of religious Jews. No worry about pigs running down the sides of hills. None of that stuff. Jewish nightmare stuff. It's all good hometown, good old Jewish folk dill pickles and whatnot. Interesting, you'd think so, but he never does. He goes right next to those big Gentile cities and never walks inside. He doesn't talk to them. He doesn't write to them. He doesn't fax, email, not a single billboard. Jesus is here. Come out to hear the great RJ speaker from the religious Jewish territory to the south. He does it to shake off the crowd. What he does is goes to a place that's uncomfortable for a large crowd of people so he can get along with his disciples. Let me say it this way. The later in the ministry, the more Jesus focuses on the group he started with, not the big crowd that surrounded him. If Jesus had died a natural death, surrounding him would not have been 5,000 people listening to his last words. Surrounding him would have been the small circle. That circle is made up of how many people? The smallest, closest circle to Jesus was how many? What's that? Three, Three including who? Here's John. Peter. These will be the center circle of Jesus' ministry. Then around them will be the nine, and then around them will be the 61, making 70 disciples, in addition to the nine, and I guess I should actually do this back to the 50s to include the other three, I did it wrong. Uh, let's see, nine, three is 12. Give me the balance of 70 minus 12. There you go, 58. So the 58 others, and out here, is the popular ministry. I love, that, I love that it goes on film that I'm absolutely mathematically inept. <laughs> Thousands. <laughs> I was a Bible major, not a math major. Around him are the thousands, but the, 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 Jesus' early ministry is actually targeted in a relatively small way. He started with five. He went to three. Went up to 70, came down to 12, and ended with 11. That was the arc of Jesus' ministry. And thousands came and thousands went, but his focused discipleship was that. So now many, many writers have early Judean ministry followed by Galilean ministry, but actually the Galilean ministry is actually three different things. Western Lower Galilee, Canaan, Nazareth, around the sea, popular ministry, the height of popularity, and then the withdrawal ministry. And the withdrawal ministry will be Jesus. <coughs> the most important things that will happen in this will be final exam, Mark chapter 8, Matthew chapter 16, transfiguration. Oops. Transfiguration, Mark chapter 9, Matthew chapter 17. Both of those will be important events. In the final exam, who comes out looking good? What's that? Pete, he got the right answer. Ooh, I know, I know. You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The next time you see Pete, he's giving advice to Jesus. Jesus, you know that cross thing, that's not going to work out. Because as soon as we get affirmed by God, we just own the part. I am the successor to Jesus. I've already printed the business cards. Okay? I will build my church. Yep, yeah, I'm the guy. I'm right here, Pete. Vote Pete. Pete for your future. And the problem is that the transfiguration leaves him with the importance and glory of Jesus, but it also, the final exam, leaves him, with, leaves him with the importance and glory of Peter. 
and that ends up being a problem. All right, so we've got the early Judean ministry, the Galilean ministry that includes in this scenario the around Galilee ministry, and then there's a whole period. Let me just also insert that during this last segment of ministry, there are Judean trips. in the Galilee and around Galilee ministry. This uh, withdrawal ministry is also called around Galilee ministry by Thomas and Gundry, who I happen to really like. The Judean trips are times when he goes up to Jerusalem. Remember Deuteronomy 16, 16 says three times a year Jews have to go up to Jerusalem. Jesus is doing that, and it happens to interrupt some of his Galilee ministry. If you don't go up, you have to pay somebody. You have to get an Anshai Ma'amada, a stander by, and you got to pay for it. But Jesus goes up many times, and John's gospel will pick up these trips, whereas Matthew sort of glosses over them like they didn't happen. I need to settle one thing before we even take a break here, and this, the issue is this. All of the gospels are summaries. None of them tell the complete story. So when Matthew says the next thing Jesus did was this, that's not what he means. He means the next thing I'm going to tell you about is this. Because Luke says he did three things in between. Now, which is right? Yes. Every history is a summary. If I say to you, what'd you do today? Lord says, oh, I went to class. No, that's not true. Your hair is done. What did you do today? Okay, well, I did my hair and I went to class. No, that's not true. You're not dressed in what you slept in. Okay, well, I got dressed, I did my hair. See, I could go, you liar! You didn't tell me you put on makeup! Every history is a summary. So don't get like this. It says, it says next he did this, not between it. He not, not a thing happened be, Of course a thing happened between. What do you want? What his hypothalamus was doing? I mean, how accurate do you want this? Do you want, and then he breathed again, and as he breathed, his liver secreted an enzyme, and as simultaneous with this, his big toe twitched, and, and a mosquito landed on the back of his neck, and he swatted it. And, and no matter what you do, you're gonna have to summarize. I'm telling you that because you're gonna walk into a college classroom, and they're gonna go, mistake, mistake, look at this gospel, look at this gospel, they don't agree. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Yes, he's going to say, straightway, Jesus went and did this. And Luke's going to say, straightway, and on the way, he did three other things. They're supposed to be summaries. Every history is a summary. But we get really funny when it comes to the Gospels. Nobody criticizes how Larissa got here. They're not going to say, she lied! But they call the Bible full of lies when it summarizes. Summaries are part of history. And I'm... I'm doing it dramatically, but I'm trying to get you to see something. Because you're going to get some guy who's going to bloviate over the Gospels and explain to you why they're all incorrect when it's just plain stupid. Yeah. Now that's all considered the Galilee ministry. The next component of the ministry that follows that is the Perean ministry. It is equal in value to the Galilean ministry, even though it's the last six months of <coughs> Jesus' ministry. Perea is that deep area inside the Jordan Rift Valley at the bottom of the mountains, and it's where snowbirds go when it's cold in the mountains. It's a Bible conference ground. It's an area where people like John the Baptizer had baptized people. It's an area where great rabbis would come and teach, and people would listen to them, and big Bible conferences of camping on the hillsides that aren't owned by anyone, and are dry, and are Often in a warmer climate, it's a great place to be when it's cold back home. And so the, there's nothing going on in the planting season for much of it. You're, you, you break up the ground with the first rains, you lay in the seed, and then you wait. So you might as well not wait in the cold. Let's go wait where it's warmer and go hear some Bible conference speakers. And the Berean ministry happens during the last six months of Jesus' ministry. There are three trips up to Jerusalem during this last six months. One of them is for Hanukkah, and it is recorded in John 10, second half of John 10. <clears throat> the second one is the Lazarus raising experience, 
and that will be in John 11. And the third one will be for uh, Passover. And that will be John 12 and following. And the point is that the pre ministry ends with this, but it's a ministry that starts by the Sea of Galilee and goes all the way along the six months journey along the Jordan River to the east side of the Jordan, going up to Jerusalem three times, but the rest of the time is basically down in that uh, area of Paris, which is under Herod Antipas. He is the ruler of Galilee, which is here, and Perea, which is here, where my finger is. So it's only this area and this area. There are two areas connected by a bridge, and those are both the territory of Herod Antipas. As a result, the Perean ministry is a portion of the ministry that if we didn't have Luke's gospel, we wouldn't understand how important it was. Matthew only has one chapter of Perean ministry, or basically two. Now, this is Matthew 19 and 20. I should say two chapters. But the middle of Luke chapter 10, the middle of Luke chapter 10, um, let's say all the way through Luke 19, and I actually could even make it the middle of Luke chapter 9. It's all the way through the middle of Luke chapter 19. There's 10 chapters of Luke's gospel that are just that last six months. So you have this huge portion of Luke's gospel. I mean, when you look at Luke's gospel, out of, out of the uh, 24 chapters of Luke's gospel, 10 of them, almost half, take place in the last six months. So if we didn't have Luke's gospel, we would miss most of the teaching of this period. When you have Matthew and Mark, you don't have the whole picture. You have the whole picture of Galilee, but you don't have the whole picture of, of the Perean ministry, that, what are often called the bad mood sayings of Jesus. These are bad mood sayings. What I mean by that is things like, let the dead bury the dead, you follow me now. I'll follow you if you can let me bury my father. No, 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 no. There's no time for that. You do it now. Remember, Jesus understands the urgency of his ministry in a way that nobody who doesn't know his hour is coming so fast would know. Only the person who knows the time clock is, is under the urgent stress of the time clock. The rest of them aren't. The only person who knew the Last Supper was the Last Supper was Jesus. The rest of them just thought it was supper. That's the point. Okay? So, the Perean ministry then. So we've got the early Judean, the Galilee, which includes the AG or around Galilee ministry, and we have the Perean ministry, which is just usually referred to as PER, and that's in, the, um, in articles concerning the ministry of Jesus, you'll see that. One last stage of Jesus' ministry, passion. And I'm gonna call it the passion and parting ministry of Jesus, because the last time Jesus goes up to Jerusalem in, Ch in John chapter 12, he doesn't leave on foot, he leaves by cloud. There's a death, there's a burial, there's a resurrection, and there's an ascension all involved in the passion and parting. This is the last week of Jesus' ministry. All right, if I do it this way, I'm going to take this, um, uh, let me zero in over here and say, if I do it this way, let me do Matthew, Mark, Luke, and let me do, for instance, early Judean ministry, uh, or let's just do Judean ministry, followed by Galilee ministry, and I'm lumping together the around Galilee and everything, followed by the uh, Perean ministry, followed by Jerusalem. Does everybody understand what I'm doing? Is that what the passion is? I am, so I am condensing this into four. I'm doing one, two, taking all of this into uh, account to here, three, four. And I'm just taking these four segments and I'm putting them here and I'm gonna quickly show you where they are. Is anybody not sure? Okay, I get it up, but I have a question. Sure. The parting of passion, this is all happening in Jerusalem, is that why you? Parting of passion is all Jerusalem. Okay, so that's why you Yes, I'm sorry. I'm assuming that you're understanding the geography, and that's not true. The, Jesus comes up in John 12 to Jerusalem, and he remains in Jerusalem and never leaves on foot. He leaves by cloud. 
He goes up from Jerusalem, but he never goes out from Jerusalem. Now, I'm actually not technically true. He does meet people in Galilee in body, but he's floating around. I'm saying the walking Jesus appears on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection. He appears to those in Galilee, but he never walks anywhere out of Jerusalem. He appears out and he leaves by a cloud. Okay, so technically speaking, he does venture outside the city. I don't know whether that's even qualified as technical. He was outside the city. However, he didn't walk there, okay? I don't have any other history of people who beamed into places. This is the only one I've got, so give me a break. Okay, here's what I want to do then. I want to take Judean ministry, Galilean ministry, Judean ministry, and passion and parting ministry, and I'm going to call passion and parting. Would it help you if I did this? Passion and parting, P and P. Okay? I'm going to break these down very quickly so that you know where they show up in the, in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Then, the balance of the day, guys, you're going to like better than you like this part. The balance of the day is we open up Matthew and start studying. That's the balance of the day, okay? Then you get to write things in your Bible and you feel good about yourself, okay? okay. First, the early Judean ministry is in Matthew 1 to 4 or the Judean ministry, Matthew 1 to 4. And you know that when I say that, that includes going to Egypt, right? In other words, that's the center of what's going on, but not everything happens within there. So I'm summarizing. I'm saying the early Judean ministry is things like, in Matthew, the genealogy, in Matthew, the uh, birth narratives, the Magi, the flight to Egypt, the return from Egypt up to Nazareth, which isn't even in Judea, and that's where it ends. Okay? So it's the early story. Of Jesus. If you continued with Matthew, you would go to uh, chapters 5 through 18 are the Galilee ministry, 19 and 20 are the Perean ministry, 21 to uh, 20, what is it, 7? Is that the end of Matthew? 27, yeah, 27. That's Matthew. There it is right there, broken down in its four basic geographical components. Matthew 1 to 4, 5 to 18, 19 to 20, 21 to 27. And this is how we will follow. What I'm going to do is establish this outline geographically, and then we will follow his life going through it a couple of times and seeing what we pick up in each one of these columns. In Mark, early Judea ministry, eh, sorry, isn't there. He starts 1 to 9 in Galilee. It starts with Jesus. It's not true because Mark 1 does refer to the ministry of John the Baptist, which is in Judea, but the center of Mark 1 already starts with the Galilee ministry. I'm being arbitrary, I know. Ver, uh, chapter 10 is all he has of Perea, nothing else. 11 to 16, the passion and pardon. There's something I should tell you about the Synoptic Gospels. I don't know why it works this way, but it works this way. If you get the last chapter of the Gospel and go minus one, it's the cross. So if that's 27, 26 is the cross. If that's 16, 15 is the cross. The last chapter's resurrection, the one before its death. If you think of it that way, it'll help you to know where to look for the death of Jesus. If you're looking for the cross, go with the end and back up one chapter. It always works in the Synoptic Gospels. Okay? Uh, all right, Luke is a little more complicated. Luke is just a complicated writer. So I want to do it in the same order. He follows it. This is 1 to chapter 4, verse 13. Why can't he just stop it there? I don't know, but somebody divided the chapters differently than this, and it's annoying. 4.14 starts the next section, which is Galilee, and it goes, in my opinion, all the way to chapter 9, verse 50. Now, why not stop it there? I don't know, but they decided to continue chapter 9. So, 9.51 goes all the way to 1910. Annoyingly, they continue along that path. And 1911, fortunately, goes to the last verse of the book in chapter 24. All right, meaning, where would the cross be? Okay, so what we did was we said that the life of Jesus, the bones of the life, are 
a Judean ministry followed by a Galilean ministry, which includes some stages within it and trips up to Jerusalem, a Perean ministry, which is the Bible conference period at the end of the last six months, and then following the passion and parting ministry of Jesus, where he appears in other places and then eventually goes up by cloud. This is largely Jerusalem. When I say it's largely of Jerusalem, what gospel would you major on here? Which, which of the four gospels spends most of his time in Jerusalem? John. John. So John is going to be the big... John 13 to 17 is just the sayings of the last night of Jesus. A third of the gospel of John is just one night. Okay? Half of the gospel of Luke is one six-month period. The bulk of the gospel of Matthew is the Galilee. Luke best details on the early life of Jesus. In other words, if I didn't have Luke, I'd be missing something here. Matthew, I'd be missing something here. Um, John, I'd be missing something here. So you see that the Gospels round out our understanding one of another. That's what they do. None of them tell you the same story, but they tell basically the same bones of the story. They follow the same line. Okay. Is the reason we're not including John in that because of what you just said about Okay, Jordan. now, here's the thing. John has no interest in telling you the story of Jesus' ministry at all. Right. He only has an interest in a polemic biography. That is, it's a biography with a point. So he's a, he can be anywhere. He doesn't care. He's interested in telling you seven things Jesus said that were I am something, and seven things Jesus did, I did something. And he picks from all over like a buffet. Put it on a chart like that. You can, and we will try, but it's very complicated because in the middle of this, in the Galilean ministry, he'll show up to Jerusalem a couple of times, and Jesus will, uh, or John will take them and just throw them into the story, and I can't tell you whether they're in order or not. I can tell you from John 7 to the end, it's in order. It's the first six chapters I can't tell you. John 7, 8, Nine and first half of ten is one feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. So I know it's, you know, a big chunk of just that feast. Second half of ten is Hanukkah. So I know that when it happens. Eleven, raising of Lazarus. I know what happens between Hanukkah and Passover. So I know when it happens. So I'm, I'm, I can sort of uh, isolate it. So in other words, John 1 to 6, he could be going backwards in time for any given. He, he can be. I don't know when he met with Nicodemus. I don't know when he did it. It just says it was nighttime. That doesn't really help me a whole lot. I'm assuming it's relatively early in the ministry, but that's an assumption because it's the third chapter of John, and John has, you know, got a lot more chapters after that. I don't know if he can really do that. So I would argue that John has no need for chronology for the first six chapters. Although I will tell you that I think John the Baptist at the beginning of the story is the right place to put it. So let me slot, lop off one and seven and follow it. Now I'm down to two through six that I don't know where it fits. And that's this it. first miracle also happens before the second. Yeah, we would think the first miracle happens before the second miracle, which I think would put John two. Now we're down to one and two. And now I've got three to six that I don't know where it is. Right. And we think that John three actually occurs in the first visit to Jerusalem after... Uh, the temptation, or the next one after that, probably four months later. But nothing really has happened so much since then. I actually think that the right way to tell the story would be to flop three, uh, two and three. To have Jesus going up to Galilee, doing the miracle in Cana, then the next trip to Jerusalem, he's already done something, so Nicodemus is asking questions. That makes more sense to me. John didn't care. So John put them in that way, and who am I to tell the Holy Spirit which way to put the books? If I called you in the middle of the night, Hannah, and I said to you, give me the most basic four-part structure to Jesus' life as it's told in the four Gospels, you would of course say to me, it starts with a Judean ministry, goes to Galilee, goes to Perea, goes to the Passion. That's what you would do. And here's my thing. If you can, and a great job, by the way. <laughs> you sounded very alive and awake for the middle of the night. Let me just say this. It's important to me that you understand the bones of it were not told to you in Sunday school. You, you have to, you're giving your life to Jesus. You should know where he was and what he said. 
Okay, before you commit, I surrender all, do you know if you like him? Okay, let's find out what he had to say. Find a place for two 